told the postman out there that should be making you work on Sunday. And he was, uh, uh, I mean, he was a little nice about it. But just couldn't get turned around with all the vehicles now out, out here. But uh, you know, it's a shame that we've come to that. Mm -hmm. This morning, <clears throat> we want to talk about a very serious subject. There won't be a lot of laughing. When we were laughing and carried on, any jokes telling or anything that was lighthearted in this message this morning. For I fear that we need to be challenged from God's word about the cry of the innocent. And so this morning, I want to direct our attention to God's word and many things that are going on in our country today where we as believers, if we truly day in the name of Christ, as we've been challenged in the last several weeks that God's Word is even magnified above His name, according to Psalm 138 and verse 2. And we believe that Jesus Christ of the Bible is the Word of God. Then we as believers, where do we come in in these situations that, that uh, have become political today? One of which is the slaughter of the unborn. And so today, we'll be looking at several different uh, scriptures, but I'll call our attention initially to Isaiah chapter 5. We'll set this up this morning to we'll find out where we are as a nation and why we have done what we have done. And what do we do about it as believers? Where are we to stand when the church is even compromising where this issue is concerned? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We need Him today to help me convey what is what He would have me convey today. This is kind of shaky thinking about it because this is such a serious subject that needs to be addressed from God's word. Oh God, we come before you today. Our hearts are, are filled with just anger and sadness and over what we've allowed to happen in this great nation. <coughs> Certainly it wasn't founded with the idea that it would turn out the way it is today. God received reaping of what we've sown in removing you from everything in this country. And now we've reaped it. And we're reaping it. But oh God, we will reap a greater judgment if we do not repent. And so we come before you today. We ask you openly the truth of your word. Uh, help me just to be your instrument. That nothing would be said for any other reason but to bring truth out and glorify the Holy Name of Jesus. To challenge our hearts as never before. In Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 5, we see the foundation for which we're going to expand upon this subject today. Let's look at verses 20 through 23. <clears throat> the prophet wrote, wrote these words many years ago through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He wrote these words as follows in verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. What a pronouncement against the wicked people of our day. It was against the wicked people of Israel back in those days, but it similarly is a pronouncement against that today. Are we afraid to speak as boldly against this wickedness as Isaiah was? Isaiah was not afraid. Are we afraid? Oh, we shouldn't be. Let me remind us of a few things. 46 years ago last month, do you realize what happened? The Supreme Court voted 7-2 to pass the Roe v. Wade decision, thus legalizing 
abor abortion in the United States of America. I remember that day well. Many of you may not, but I remember it very well. January 22nd, 1973. You realize that was actually just two days after President Nixon was inaugurated for the second time on January 20th, 1973. We just had an election in November of 72. We realize just how incredible this was. Let's just consider some of the uh, statistics involving this. The vote was, wrote, was, was seven to two in favor of Roe v. Wade. Seven, uh, uh, seven of them voted, five of them were Republicans. Interesting, wasn't it? Three of them were, were appointed by President Nixon. Two of them appointed by President Eisenhower. There were two Democrats, one appointed by Franklin Roosevelt and one appointed by Lyndon Johnson. There were two dissents. One was Byron White, Judge Byron White, appointed by John F. Kennedy, who was a Democrat. The other was William Rehnquist, who was appointed by um, President Nixon who under President Reagan was appointed as Chief Justice later on when he became president. Court in that day consisted of six Democrats, I mean six Republicans, and three Democrats. You wouldn't think so, would you? Based on what we have heard today. We hear the cries of the, of the Democrats. You think all the Republicans, the Republican Party has always been in favor of what's right where this issue is concerned. Let me share with you, oh, it's not. I praise God for those who dissented. William Rehnquist dissented on that, was against abortion very vocally all the way to his death several years later. Byron White, even though a Democrat appointed by President Kennedy, could not reconcile this. He was totally against the abortion and that was taking place and it was being prom uh, promoted in that day. Praise God that two of them stood up against this. But isn't it interesting that of those that voted on this, <laughs> the Republicans are in charge. Are we supposed to have faith in Republicans? Now, after what they did then, 46 years ago, are we supposed to have faith in them? <laughs> Rhetorical question. Obviously, the answer is no. Let me read you uh, some inf interesting information. This came out of a report by LifeNews.com on January 18, 2018. That's last year. <clears throat> 45 years. They wrote the following words. The United States marks 45 years of legalized abortion in all 50 states at any time for any reason throughout pregnancy on January 22nd, the anniversary of Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision. Listen to this. Since that time, there have been an estimated 60,069,971 abortions that have destroyed the lives of unborn children. That was a little over a year ago. You factor that out and carry it forward another year, it's estimated that that number is approximately 61 and a half million unborn babies have been slaughtered in this country. You realize that's an average of 1,337,000 children slaughtered per year for 46 straight years. That equates to 3,663 per day for 46 straight years. You understand that is that from the time that we met this morning and started our service at 1045 until approximately the time we get through eating, that might be, you say, 145, three hours, 450 babies will be slaughtered in this country while we're eating and having the worship service. 450. Can you believe it? Where is the outcry from the believers for this holocaust? 
Where's the outcry from the church for this Holocaust? I think the last verse of the book of Judges is a phrase at the very end of Judges 21, verse 25, that describes the answer. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's where we're at. The silence is deafening, is it not? slaughter of the unborn <clears throat> has become so political over the years. Can you believe it? After 46 years, now we're talking about slaughtering them after they're born. What's happening to this nation? What's happening to the church? I was thinking when I was doing this study, today, 16 years ago, my mother passed away. I'll never forget my mother, who was a prayer warrior, who prayed for me many, many years, all my life. She would be appalled just in 16 years to see what we have done. I was thinking, Praise God she didn't have to see this. Praise God Earl didn't have to see this. My dad didn't have to see this. Do we here at New Testament Christian Fellowship really understand the seriousness of this atrocity? I wonder sometimes if we really grasp it. Because we go on with life. That's why I say this is not a laughing matter. This is not an upbeat message that we're going to talk about today in exploring God's Word. This is of all seriousness. And it should bring us to a place of repentance. Does anyone hear the cry from the blood of these innocent ones? We may not hear, but let me tell you for certain, Almighty God hears it. He hears their cry, and He will avenge their blood. He will do it. There is a certain day of judgment coming. And just as happened back in the book of Genesis, when Cain slaughtered his brother Abel, who was innocent in that situation. He had brought the righteous offering to God. What does God's Word tell us there? That the blood of Him from the ground cries out before God. And God hears it. And brothers and sisters, some of them are laid there today. The blood of 61 and a half million babies slaughtered in this country is crying out to Almighty God, and let me be certain and forthright to tell you, He is hearing it. And the judgment day is coming to this nation if it has not already begun. Well, we need to examine some things about the subject of God's Word. Several points today I want us to consider. Number one, unborn babies are human beings. Some would refute that. Oh, how wicked they are. Unborn babies are human beings. Make no mistake about it. They are not just masses of flesh inside a woman's body. They are not just, just fetuses. I hate that word. They're babies. Human beings. God's Word recognizes them as children, that life begins at conception. In fact, uh, Leviticus 17.11 tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. Speaking of uh, dealing with uh, animal sacrifices back then, but it's a general statement being made about all life. The 
blood. Uh, it, it does, it's that exact word is said, the life of the flesh in Leviticus 17.11. The blood type, actually my research looking into this, becomes independent from the mother. That means it is of the mother's type initially, so blood is there, but it becomes independent from the mother some 18 to 21 days after conception. Not months, where they're not viable, as our leaders would tell us. They're telling us they're not viable when they're on their own, even outside the womb now. Some of our leaders have even proposed in recent years having the right to murder them up to age two. God's Word tells us they're human beings. It recognizes that life begins at conception. <clears throat> Did you know that God's Word gives us seven examples of people who were named before they were even born? So many years. But there are seven examples in Scripture of people who were named before they were born. So, God doesn't look at it as a mass of flesh. God looks at it as a child. Once conceived, is a human being. The first example is given in Genesis 16, 11. <clears throat> the son of Hagar, the handmaid of Sarah, who was born when Abraham went in unto her. In verse 11 of chapter 16, we find these words, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, speaking to Hagar, who had run into the wilderness, said these words, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. This child, she was conceived. The child had, uh, was there inside of her. God recognized Ishmael as a child, as a human being. Not as some fetus or mass of flesh. Part of a woman's body to have rule over it, to destroy it if, if she so decides. Later in the next chapter, we find the second example of this. Chapter 17 and verse 19. And God said, Sarah, take speaking to Abraham, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call him his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. The father of nations. Isaac was born. Before he was born, he was also had been conceived inside of Sarah. But God recognized him as well as a baby, as a human being inside of Sarah. <coughs> the third one, if you turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 22, in verse 9, we'll find the third one is King Solomon. Maybe you didn't realize this one. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, in verse 9. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. For his name shall be Solomon, who give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. The wisest man that ever lived was also named while he was inside his mother's womb. He was a human being as well. God recognized him. As a human being. Turn back to 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 2. We'll discover the fourth example. So we'll back up, take chapter uh, verse 1 to kind of set the stage of it. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense <coughs> upon thee. And men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. 
King Josiah wasn't even conceived. And God saw some 32 years prior to his birth, assigned his name to it because he recognized that he would be conceived in his mother's womb and that he too was a human being. The fifth example is found in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 28. God is saying this, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou art, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Cyrus, the king of Persia, it was prophesied some 150 years before he was born. That he, not it, but he would be born. His name was given. And when he was conceived, that name applied to him as a human being as well before God. You kind of get the sense that God doesn't look at things the way we have become accustomed to seeing it in our country today. God doesn't look at people as any other thing than human beings, no matter at what stage they are formed. Turn to Luke chapter 1. You'll find the sixth example of this. <clears throat> In verse 31. I mean, excuse me, verse 13. Right? But the angel of the Lord said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. It's John the Baptist, who was conceived inside of Elizabeth, cousin of Mary. God recognized him as well as a human being. He was the forerunner of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And finally, number seven. <clears throat> And it obviously is, comes to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Two examples. Hold your place in Luke chapter 1 and turn back to Matthew chapter 1. For he expresses, uh, has this expressed twice. Once to Joseph and once to Mary. In uh, chapter 1 of Matthew verse 20 and verse 21. And the dream that comes to Joseph during the night. Listen to what he has to say here. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. I'll look back to Luke chapter 1 again. <clears throat> what happens in verses 30 and 31? The angel comes to Mary. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast, been, thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Oh, my friends, the ultimate example of God recognizing that all babies are human beings is given in the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, God's Word recognizes that life begins at conception. God's Word gives examples of names given to unborn babies. And thirdly, God's Word gives examples of men who acknowledge being known by God before birth. We touched a little bit on this some Wednesday, couple Wednesday nights ago, right after that boat was taking place. I mean, all that mess was going on in uh, uh, Virginia and that boat in New York. And I shared a few things about this back then. But we have three examples <clears throat> that uh, were given in the Old Testament that God had acknowledged these men as being known uh, by God 
before birth. The first one found in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 1. The prophet Isaiah recognizing here, God named him while in his mother's womb. Look at the first verse of, of chapter 49. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. Inside his mother's womb, God did not call Isaiah a fetus. He didn't call him a mass of flesh, fleshy tissue that could be extracted like it's an appendix or a tumor. God recognized that the prophet Isaiah was called by name from his mother's womb. The second example is found in Jeremiah chapter 1. <clears throat> Listen to what God's Word says. I shared this uh, some weeks ago. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God did not form a piece of, mat, of fleshy tissue or tumor in the belly of his mother. He didn't form a tomb, I mean a, a tumor or a mass of flesh that he sanctified. He didn't form a tumor or a massive mass of flesh that he would ordain to be a prophet to the nations. Oh no. Our God recognized. He knew Jeremiah. He sanctified Jeremiah. And he ordained Jeremiah to be a prophet before he was conceived. Pretty clear. God recognizes that all babies are human beings. <clears throat> Final example of the greatest passages of description of the unborn baby is found in the 139th Psalm. King David recognizes who he is and who he was inside his mother's womb and gives detail here. God described David and reveal that to him in human form while in his mother's womb. And if any of you have ever seen an ultrasound and watched that pretty closely, you can see them pretty clearly today. It's pretty incredible. It's easy to see that that child is a human being and not a mass of flesh. That's why the abortionists don't want the mothers to see the ultrasound because it will help them see that very thing. But David is describing here, beginning in verse 13, <clears throat> the incredible uh, creation of the baby, new life within his mother. He says these words, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And, my, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thy eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And then thy book, all my, numbers were, my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet... There was none of them. You understand what that says? God is describing the features of this incredible creation of a child inside <coughs> David's mother's womb. That being him. It's the same is true with us. This is a description of what we are 
inside our mother's womb. I don't see anything hinting that there's a tumor or a mass of flesh or a, some kind of growth in there. I see it very, uh, de de very detailed in description. What does he say? By substance was not hid from thee. Oh no, but God saw it. God sees. God sees what, what, what the child is made of. When I was made in secret and curiously brought in the lowest part of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, not all totally formed. Have you seen the ultrasounds of different stages of life? And you see things that begin to come together and shape themselves within the, in preparation for birth and coming out into the new world. He says, all my, book, my members were written. Arms, legs, fingers, all the parts of my body were written. And yet, we got those cello parts today. Hmm. Praise God that He recognizes the truth. All my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned. Continuing to be fashioned together, brought together, and shaped up, getting ready for birth, when yet, as yet, there was none of them. God described David in human form, pretty descriptively there, didn't he? What does that further tell us? The second major point is unborn babies are valuable. It just galls me of the lack of value of the human life today in this country. But make no mistake, unborn babies are valuable to God. How do we know that? All the way back to the first chapter of the Bible, we'll find these words. God in creation. Very familiar passage, Genesis chapter 1. Verses 26 and 27. This is the triune God speaking of what they're doing in creation here. And God said, verse 26, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. All human beings. We've verified God recognizes unborn babies as human beings. So all human beings are created in the image of God. Now I must interject here. Just a little side note. All people, children, adults, all have been born as babies. They all are creations of God. But I must remind us, especially those of you here that are not born again, that all people are not children of God. They're all creations of God. There is a, an eternal, distinct difference here to be a child of God. You must repent of your sins and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone to be born again. Please understand that, little ones. Yes, you are a creation of God. We all are. But His desire is that you be a child of God. A child of God that will spend eternity with Him. Listen to the words. He speaks to your little hearts. Ones of you that are, that are lost. Let him speak to your heart. Don't back away from it. Don't shy away from it. We will support you in any way to help you understand anything where God's word is concerned. Please understand that. And here, listen. Just as Eli told Samuel many years ago, when he was awakened, and, and he went to, he was troubled. He was a young boy. Didn't know what to do. And Eli told him to just say, speak, Lord, for I serve him here. Go back and say to the Lord, speak to me and listen. 
what he has to say. These unborn babies are valuable to God. But why? All are created in God's image. And all are created with incredible details. A couple of uh, examples of this. Psalm 119. The longest chapter in the Bible. One, verse 73. <clears throat> the writer pins these words. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. God's made us. He's fashioned us. He put all the fingers and toes and legs and arms and head and torso and every part of us together, didn't he? He fashioned us. Do we recognize that? Does, that? does that show you and help us understand how valuable we are to God? He didn't just throw us together. He put us together with incredible detail. Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> Solomon writes these words in the 11th chapter. In verse 5. Ecclesiastes 11, 5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Boy, well, that ought to be that ought to be shouted from the halls of Congress to those wicked people sitting in there that think they know everything. The writer speaks here. God speaks through him. As thou knowest what is the way of the Spirit, you don't. Nor do you know how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child that you call a mass of fleshy tissue that can be discarded. Even so, you know not the works of God who make it all human beings. <laughs> and then Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, in verse 30, <clears throat> we find what he has to say here. Matthew 10, verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all some had less. I know. Have, I mean, I, have you ever stopped to try to count the hairs in your head? I wouldn't even give it a try. Because it changes every day. Every time you take a shower, something comes out. But that's how valuable we are to God. He didn't just throw us out there on our own and say, have at it. We are created in the image of God. And we are created with incredible detail. <clears throat> So unborn babies are valuable to our God. Thirdly, understand that unborn babies are the most innocent. If this won't get you riled up, I don't know what will as we go through this part. We understand that God hates the killing of the innocent. Let us go to that passage. And as I thought on this, I shared some of this one time before, but I got thinking more and more about it. It was so obvious that every single point in this chapter applies to this today. It applies to several things, but it's this uh, today. It's not, not a problem putting this in, in uh, context. Let's examine those seven abominations in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, and their application to this sin. Let's look here. This in verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among Brethren. Oh, my friends, what is an abomination? When I see that word, there's not even a hint of anything good in it. There's not even a hint of any little aspect of it that can be liked or that God likes. An abomination means it's totally despicable in the eyes of God. He hates it. He wants nothing to do with it. 
There are many things he talks about that are abominations. We won't get into all of those. Sexual perversion is an abomination before God. And we must stand against it. And anything that is called an abomination before God, if we call ourselves believers, if we call ourselves true followers of Jesus Christ, we must, we must stand against those abominations. There must be no compromise. And oh, we're seeing it everywhere in the church today. Not only this subject is being excused, and women are made victims so we can understand what they're going through and thus slaughter the unborn child inside of her. Or now even being proposed to slaughter the born child just coming out of her. God hates it. And we at this church hate it. We will never excuse it. I do not believe that any abortion for any reason should be allowed to happen. Amen. Those are children created by God. Amen. And we have no right to be judge and jury to determine who lives and who does not live. Oh, they make excuses about the rape and incest, all of that, which are, I don't discount the heartache that happens with that. I cannot understand that. But at the same time, that is not the baby's fault. The baby deserves, why should the baby be condemned to, to physical death and slaughter because of the sin and wickedness of others? Oh yes, those are real things that do happen. And even aside from that, those have been made by the politicians as excuses from that small percentage to just lay a blanket over it all and excuse all slaughter of the unborn. They make it the reason to do it. And by far, by far, I don't know the percentages, but it's really up there in the 90s. The babies don't go, they're born not as a result of those types of situations. But make no mistake, we do not excuse the slaughter of the, un of the unborn under any circumstance. And that's God's that's his to do, his to deal with. Job cried out, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what we're to say in any situation, even in this type of thing. The unborn baby, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. He does it, not us. Woe unto us that think we can do that type of a thing, that we can slaughter an unborn baby. Not think twice of that. Let's look at this passage. What's the very first thing? Every one of these things apply <coughs> so incredibly. The first thing is a proud look. <clears throat> if any of you have ever been to the abortion clinics, and I've been many times, as many of you, several of you have, <laughs> you can see the proud look everywhere. It's everywhere. There's no bit of humility at that clinic. And the people that are, that are going in and out of there, there's no degree of humility. The bouncers that stand around and try to threaten those who are preaching the word, preaching the word of God, and trying to call out to these mothers and their partners, whatever husbands or boyfriends or whatever they are, to try not to not to slaughter their babies. You don't see anything but a proud look. It's everywhere. The faces at the abortion clinics. The proud looks. I thought about that when I saw uh, what was played and what happened in New York when they voted that wicked bill into law and all the cheering and putting of, a, of the, uh, uh, I guess, whatever they lit up the house with, I guess it was the, uh, the homosexual covers or whatever it was that they did. They celebrated it. I didn't see any humility there, did you? And was it saw it? They were full of pride. God hates it. God hates the proud look. And he hated everything going on that day. Amen. God hates it at the abortion clinic when those wicked people take go through and follow through what they're doing. God hates a proud look. Oh, we as believers, do we have a proud look? Are we guilty of having that proud look? 
I hope not. And if we are, we need to repent of it. The second thing here in verse 17 is a lying tongue. And I thought about all the lies told to the mothers who are coming in there to slaughter their babies. They're being told that they're going to be better off. They're being told you can have your life later. It's going to be fine. You're going to be able to get over this. They're being lied to. The lies told that God will understand while you're murdering your unborn child. Oh, my friend, God hates the lying tongue. And they're everywhere. Lying tongues everywhere. We see it in our politicians who think not twice about using the lying tongue. God doesn't forget. God, God doesn't forget the proud looks. God doesn't forget the lying tongues. And thirdly, He does not forget the hands that shed innocent blood. The abortion doctors, the politicians, yes, the pastors who excuse these acts of violent murder are those being described here and having their hands shedding innocent blood. Make no mistake of understanding it's in the church. They're excusing it. They're allowing it. And those leaders of the church are guilty of having that innocent blood on their hands. We will not be guilty of it here. Amen. This church will not be guilty of shedding innocent blood. Proverbs 28, 17. A man that doeth violence to the blood of any person shall flee to the pit. Let no man stay him or help him. Don't hold him back. He needs to flee to the pit of hell for having done such. It's everywhere today. It's being supported by those who will make a political position out of this moral issue. The abortion doctors, yes. The politicians, yes. Even the pastors are excusing, are excusing this act of violent murder. Doesn't stop there, does it? The fourth description Found in verse 18, hearts that devise wicked imaginations. <laughs> it takes a wicked heart to devise the imaginations by which they slaughter these unborn babies. I can't even stomach thinking about how that's done. How they rip them out of their mother's womb, piece by piece. Or now they let them be born, then they crush the skull. How in the world can people come up with wicked imaginations? Well, Jeremiah describes it best. The heart is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand the, the vastness of that wickedness? We're so wicked. The heart can devise wicked imaginations. And God hates it. He hates the heart that devises wicked imaginations. In fact, I remember... A few years ago, standing out there preaching at the abortion clinic, and there were some of those workers in there, and it was just disgusting. It was coming out for their cigarette smoke. And oh my, they wanted to talk about how God loves everyone. Well, I just hit them right back between the eyes when Psalm 5 5 tells us, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. God hates them. He hates them with a righteous hatred that we cannot understand. Our hatred is different. But God hates the workers of iniquity. They're an abomination to Him. Those whose hearts devise wicked imaginations. That is, the politicians who devise ways to murder the unborn for convenience. The doctors who devise ways to murder them to sell the body parts. The women and the men who together want to murder their for selfish reasons and continue to have sexual relations, and the cycle just continues to repeat itself. Oh my. This is abomination before a righteous God. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. The 
Look what it says next in verse 18. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Have you noticed that when they want to pass something, they are swift to get about it, pushing their agenda. They don't waste any time. They're swift about running into mischief. <coughs> Isaiah 59, verse 7. <coughs> we find these words, Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. What a perfect description of what's going on there. About the feet that be swift in running to mischief. Yeah, they hurry to get inside that abortion clinic. I've been there. I've seen it. They get out of the car. They don't want to hear those that are pleading for the lives of their unborn. They want to be swift to getting into there and having this wickedness performed upon them and the slaughter of the unborn. Politicians, the doctors, the patients with their partners quickly run to do this evil. My friends, God hates this. It is an abomination to you before God. Hmm. Next we find, sixthly, verse 19. <clears throat> A false witness that speaketh why. A lot of this is in the church. Those who stand by and support this wickedness while lying about the facts. They continue to do so and it's being excused in the church. If you look over just a few chapters in Proverbs 28, these people, even within the church, that, that is where it's most... The politicians are doing what we expect them to do. They're lost. They're, they hate anything that has to do with God. And yet you wonder, why we're this way? Well, we've taken God out of everything. 1961 or 62, we took prayer out of schools. As a result of that, 11, 12 years later, we have the Roe Ro versus Wade because the value of life has been diminished to nothing. And so you wonder why. And that's the, that's the reason. But in the church, those who stand by and support this wickedness, they're doing so. They are false witnesses that speak lies. They're lying about the facts of what abortion does, not only physically, but emotionally to the woman that's allowed this to happen. They don't tell them the truth. They don't tell them what actually happens with this child being ripped apart piece by piece? They don't have to sit there and watch it take place. God says He hates those who speak lies. And to those who would claim to be able to pray before Almighty God, look what Proverbs 28 verse 9 says. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law or the truth of God's Word, even his prayer shall be abomination. There's another abomination before the Lord, which is God. If we turn our ears away from the law, that's God's Word, the truth of His Word, and what He's telling us, and we try to rationalize this in a way to just get along with people. And God says our prayer will even be abomination to Him. You want to be guilty of praying abominational, abominable prayers? Go to Almighty God. I don't. <coughs> And finally, look what the ultimate result of all of these six previous ones. And you see it right here in the church. Look at verse 18. I mean, verse 19. And he that soweth discord among brethren. Brethren, that's dealing with believers within the church. And discord, God hates it. We've had to deal with some discord in our church in the past, in the 12 and almost 13 years that we've been in existence. And God hates it. And God rooted, has rooted it out. Praise Him. Because that is displeasing to Him. He hates it. It's an abomination. Those pastors and leaders in, in this sin 
particularly we're talking about today, who would promote this in the church and bring confusion to the people. <clears throat> and God hates it. When you promote something that's against the truth of His Word, it is discord. Anything being preached in a church today that does not come directly from God's Word is discord. Amen. God hates it. It's an abomination before Him. In fact, look at Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15. <clears throat> and see what God has to say further about those who would do such a thing as leaders in the church. Or leaders in that spiritual leaders in that day. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. If anyone outside this place ever hears this message, I don't know. But pastors, if you're anywhere across this country or this world, are promoting this act of vengeance and murder and hatred toward the most innocent of all, the unborn, let me tell you, based on the truth of God's Word, He will not hear your prayers. Your hands are full of the blood of the innocent unborn. And you're guilty before an Almighty God. The only hope for you, before your congregations, if you preach anything other than the truth of God's Word, is to repent. The Bible talks of us the only ones that can come before God are those that are of a clean hands and a pure heart. You can't have one without the other. Your hands are dirty if you're guilty. Your hands are dirty with the blood of the unborn who have been slaughtered. Well, <clears throat> Not only are unborn babies the most innocent. The fourth point, unborn babies' murders are sins that will be avenged. Make no mistake, friends, fellow brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. Our country will be judged for the slaughter of 61 and a half million unborn innocent lives. It will happen. We think we don't see it now where things going along just well. <clears throat> and yet we've got other problems. We hear people talking about the economics of things in this country and the push to socialism. And I look at the financial side and I see all the unfunded liabilities that never been put on the balance sheet of this country that are in excess of $200 trillion that cannot even be fathomed as an amount of money. Oh yes, we're in a state of, of calamity where finances are concerned, but that pales in comparison to the state of immoral depravity we're in in this country today, where 61 and a half million unborn babies in this country alone have been slaughtered since Roe v. Wade in 1973. And I tell you, God remembers every single one of them. And He will avenge the blood of each one of those, not the whole group, each one of those individually. God will avenge their blood. Let's look and see what God says in His Word about this. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 32. In verse 35. Deuteronomy 32 verse 35. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that thou shalt come upon them, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. It's coming. That's a sure promise to those who reject God. And my friends, you cannot be a believer and accept and, and say that this is okay. It cannot happen. Just as we believe there's no one that can be truly born again and, and be a homosexual 
or live in sexual depravity and wickedness. That cannot happen. The same is true here. You cannot believe that this is okay. The slaughter of the unborn and call yourself a believer. God says it will come to take place. To Him belong good vengeance. It's not for us. We don't need to go burn down the abortion clinics as some have done. No, that's not our place. To God belong with vengeance. Let Him take care of it because His vengeance will take place. We don't know when, but we know based on His Word, it shall come. Their foot shall slide slide in due time. It's going to slide out from under them and they're going to hit the ground. The day of their calamity is at hand and the Lord knows when that is. And it will come faster than they think. They think they're indestructible. Look what Paul says in the right in the writings in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. He says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, quoting back from that passage we just read in Deuteronomy 32. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, <coughs> saith the Lord. That's a certainty. Just as we have the certain hope of the believer, we have the hope of God's wrath, the certainty of it. It will come upon those who have committed this wickedness and are still doing so. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. The same passage uh, the writer Paul is expressing here to the Jewish folks. He's writing this book too. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Finally, next to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 21, we find the ultimate, the ultimate end to these wicked people in verse 8 of Revelation chapter 21. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's a certainty. It's coming. So don't take it upon ourselves. We must continue to preach the word, we must understand how wicked this is. I want us to listen to something now. I hope it will grip your hearts. We understand what this is all about. We understand the seriousness of it. Not something to just walk away from here today and not think, not think about it again. Oh, my friends, this must be our thoughts and minds. I couldn't even sleep last night trying to think through this mess again. It was just, just so appalling that we've come to this place in our country. So last night I need to play this for us and give us a good description of some things. come to in this nation. Did you listen? It's a perfect description.
them in thousands without blinking an eye. What shame upon this nation. We're killing thousands, believing the lie. And she expressed that lie in that song. Why should I have to go through nine months of pregnancy for a mistake that I made? And it'd be just as easy to take that away and everything will be okay. And so we just take it away. My God, we're killing thousands without blinking an eye, believing the lie of Satan. God, have mercy on us. You want to know what type of a God we have? He's long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Unborn babies' murders are sins, and yes, as awful as they are, that can be forgiven. We must understand three things <clears throat> about this. Number one, the murders of the unborn are national sins as well as individual sins. Number two, there must be true repentance. Number three, there will then and only then be forgiveness and healing. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Tells us, <clears throat> and we've talked about this so many times, we can never say it enough. The fourfold formula for healing in this wicked land is given <clears throat> there in 2 Chronicles 7 14. If my people, the believers in the holy righteous God, which are called by my name, First, if they would humble ourselves before a righteous God. There are four things here. Let's consider each one. James 4.10 tells us, Humble yourselves in the sight of, of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. So we must first humble ourselves before a righteous God. If we even seek to want to have things right, made right with Him, it has to be a repentant heart. And only a repentant heart can humble himself or herself. Without these, in the order in which they're given in this passage of Scripture, the end result will not take place. So we cannot switch them around. We can't leave one out <clears throat> or two out because we don't like the sound of it. It must be every one of these prerequisites to healing and forgiveness. We must first humble ourselves. If my people which are, call, are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Secondly, we must cry out to God. In prayer, and one of the greatest prayers that I remember for a nation was when Daniel prayed and cried out to a righteous God for his nation living in rebellion in their, in, in their captivity there in that Daniel chapter 9. We must recognize and admit in our prayer the way that Daniel admitted the problem within his own nation. Verse 16, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thy anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that is that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear, our pra hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Oh, my friends, we're desolate in this country. Desolate before a righteous God. We must cry out to Him in prayer. Just as Daniel cried out for the sake of his nation. Are we willing to do that? 
We must humble ourselves before righteous God, then cry out to Him in prayer. The third thing it says, as we quote that verse, uh, uh, that we must first humble ourselves. Then we cry out to God and it says, and pray. And turn from our and seek God's face, rather. Right? Seek God's face is that. We can pray, but there are a lot of people that are praying today, but not to the God of the Bible. We've heard uh, we, in some of the, uh, some of these programs we watch, their ID of, of different trying to identify who murders these people, some of these things on TV are really interesting. But I've, I've been struck by many times how people talk about how they pray for this, pray for that while they're living with someone in sin, and they got caught, and they got killed, or someone someone got murdered over it. And they talk about it. Well, we've just been praying that God would do this. Well, we're not praying to God. Bob. There's no repentance for what they've been doing. We must humble ourselves. We must cry out to God. Uh, to God in prayer. And we must thirdly seek God's face. Isaiah writes these urgent words to us in Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7 a call to us today. There's the implication here that it will not always be this way when he wrote these verses in ver verses 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. What's the implication there? He will not always be able to be found. <coughs> There will be a day when he will not be able to be found. Praise God, that's not the day. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him turn unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's what seeking God's face is. Not calling, well, God, help me, help me, help No, seeking God's face. It's ac ac accurately described there in that passage of Scripture. And then fourthly, we must turn from our sin. People don't want to hear that today. <clears throat> oh, we can go through, we can pray out to a God. And I'm so, we've heard in some of the deals with some of the people that uh, Teresa helps them talk about situations and how they're just unlucky. They consider themselves unlucky. While they're living in their sins, the, soccer, the, uh, the consequences of those sins come upon them and they're just unlucky in life. They just got a bad deal. No. They're not recognizing the facts here that they are sinning before a righteous God. And we cannot sin as believers. Of course, those people, some of them are not even believers that she deals with helps try to help understand God. But we as believers must understand that we're, we wonder sometimes why we're not blessed of the Lord. And if we ever stop and, and examine our lives to see if there's unconfessed sin there. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It doesn't say the Lord won't hear my neighbor or my spouse or my children. No, He won't hear you. He won't hear me if I regard iniquity in my heart. We must turn from our sins. As it expresses in that verse, turn from their wicked way. <clears throat> if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Peter is preaching here. And he expresses this passage in verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence <coughs> of the Lord. Perfect example of what is involved in salvation right here in that passage. The first thing he said is repent. What does repent mean? Repent literally means to say again. So when we repent before God, repentance is not forgive me for all my, for all my sins. That's not repentance. For God, repentance is, oh God, I have a problem with the bitterness. And I've been bitter toward this person. Repent. And I ask you to forgive me. And cleanse me from this righteousness. We must turn 
from our sin. Without those four prerequisites, the result cannot <coughs> take place. What does he say? If all of those things are taking place in our lives, and I believe corporately, I mean nationally, as well as corporately as a church too sometimes, and as us individually, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins. My friends, where's the call to repentance? Oh, that our leaders and our president would call this nation to repentance. He calls us to everything else. And we're told this and that. We, and are good, maybe some good things involved are there, but the ultimate answer is that our nation has committed 61 and a half million murders before a holy, righteous God of just those murders, the unborn, not counting the others in life. And where's the repentance for killing? We're killing millions without blinking an eye. We're killing millions believing the lie of Satan. That it's okay. 1 John 1 9 tells us these incredible words. If we confess our sins, that's repentance before God. He is faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what true repentance will result in. The cleansing of the heart from the wickedness made clean. You notice after the you had a couple of uh, brushes with hurricanes this past summer, and when all that blew through, I was out of the way, how clear the air was. The sky was not a dot of a cloud in the sky once it all cleared out. Because it had been clean. The atmosphere had been clean. You could breathe better for a little bit until it started getting polluted again. But more importantly is this. When God cleanses the heart, He wipes away the sin. He cleans it up. Create in me, David said, a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. How can anyone have that joy while committing these murders? It can't happen. <clears throat> oh, that we would see a call to repentance. As we mentioned before, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10. Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground. Be assured. We know that being so. We know that equally. The voices of these murdered, slaughtered, innocent, 61 and a half million unborn babies cries out to God. Will you... And will I cry out for the innocent unborn? Or will we just keep silent? May God wake us up to proclaim the truth of His Word till He comes again. Oh God, we come before you. We thank you for your Word. It cuts. You say in Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the, and of the thoughts, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, even as it cuts through through the joints and marrow of the bones. God, we praise you that your Word is convicting. It's convicting us today. We've, been, we've shied away from sin. Maybe it's something that we feel threatened in a workplace. If something comes up that we don't speak truth, we don't want to offend anybody. But Lord, your word offends. It needs to offend us today. I pray that it has offended us. Oh God, that we'll go from this place. Determine that what is written in your word is what we, what we will proclaim faithfully until you call us home. That we would not shy away from the truth of your word. Have mercy, oh God, on this nation. We slaughtered 61 and a half million unborn, innocent, precious lives that you created. 
all for the sake of convenience or excuse of sin, just as we try to redefine everything else in this world to make an excuse for our sins. Oh God, we deserve your judgment. We know it's coming. But for the sake of the remnant, may many eyes and hearts turn to you in repentance and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That we would detest such wickedness as this and stand against it and not promote it and not vote for those who promote this in any way, shape, or form in our in our upcoming elections, Lord, that we would, more importantly above anything else, desire to know where a politician or some leader or judge stands on this issue alone, where this is the foundation on which all other issues rest. And so, Lord, we seek your discernment. We ask your healing. We ask you for the sake of our country. We repent of this sin. Oh, God, we, we're so wicked. We deserve the, the power of your wrath upon us. And yet, because of your long suffering and not being willing that any should perish, you're not even willing that the abortion doctors should perish, but that they would come to repentance. We pray against these wicked places that you would shut them down mm -hmm. and destroy these wicked people that you hate. But God, if there's a chance for any of them to repent, as there still is, if they haven't been turned over to reprobate minds, we pray that you would convict them and call them by the power of the Holy Spirit of God to repentance and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Then they would turn away from this sin and walk away from it and never participate in it ever again. We pray for healing in this land, oh God. We need it so desperately. Thank you for the truth from your word today. I trust that I have it in any way that you would have me sin to us all. We ask also that you bless the food we have to take of. May it uh, give us the physical strength we need. May we meditate on these truths.